Hello, everybody, and thank you for coming. I'm Anthony Sutliff, president of the Secular Student Alliance here at Ferris State University. We're an RSO here on campus for atheists, agnostics, and other free thinkers. And now I'm going to turn it over to Rob Wagner of the Truth Discovery Project, one of our co-sponsors for this event. Yeah, Rob. Good evening. I'm with the Truth Discovery Project, so we were interested in the ideas of truth, and so most of you are here because we, we have a, a debate where we're, we're taking two issues and allowing them to challenge each other. So we encourage you to take those ideas seriously, to think about the issues involved. If there's questions you want to talk more about, maybe arguments that you've heard that you're interested in talking more about, we're planning to have an event Monday evening, this coming Monday evening, at the West Campus Community Center. But if you're interested, contact us either on our Facebook page, Truth Discovery Project, or at the table outside the door, and we'll get an idea how many people are interested. Um, you probably saw the table out there. Everything on it is free. Help yourself. If you'd like to give us your contact information so you can find out about future events like this, there's paper on the table. You can do that. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I just wanted to take a moment to thank the Office of Diversion and Inclusion. Also, we'd like to thank Jake and Hugo from the Bible Reloaded for being here to moderate the event. Um, and finally, Justin and Steven for coming from Grand Rapids and Oakland for um, supporting us and debating. Um, now I'm going to turn it over to Jake and Hugo to introduce the debaters, and I hope you guys enjoy. tonight's event, a debate, on the <clears throat> a debate on the existence of the Christian God. I'm Hugo. And I'm Jake. And we are both from The Bible Reloaded, a YouTube channel that is basically an atheist Bible study. Yep. Uh, we basically just read it from a secular perspective. It's a kind of a comedy show. But we're in a more serious role today, and we are moderating. And just because we are technically on Justin's side today, uh, doesn't mean at all that we're going to favor Justin, or we're no, not going to favor... Stephen. So we are. We were asked to do this, and it's an honor, and it's a great privilege. And we have so many people here we did not expect. Uh, so thank you, everyone, for coming. Um, also, there are comment cards um, strewn about on the tables. Um, if you guys have any questions that you want to be answered at the end of the debate, um, feel free to fill those out. Um, and then we'll collect them right before we do that, um, which will be after the uh, cross examine the final uh, statements. Yeah, and as well, obviously, as we said, a lot more people than we expected. So if there aren't enough cards out there, if you have a scrap piece of paper or anything, you can just use that, and we'll collect those along with the others uh, later. Yep, and uh, we, uh, obviously we can't get to everybody, so we'll rifle through them as fast as possible. We'll get uh, some good questions, and then you guys can have a chance to uh, ask your own philosophical questions to these two great guys. Um, yeah. So now, uh, a couple more things, just quickly. Uh, anyone has cell phones or anything, try and silence them if you can. Uh, and I think it goes without saying, but regardless of your own personal opinions, we're all respectful of each of the speakers. They've given their time here. Um, so let's just be aware of that. And quickly, we'll go over the format, and then we'll introduce the speakers. Um, there's going to be an opening statement for both of them. Uh, they'll each get 20 minutes for that. Then they'll have time to rebut each other's opening statements. Uh, that'll be 10 minutes. Then there will be a cross-examination period where they'll be able to ask each other questions, a more conversational uh, sort of thing. And then uh, we'll get the closing statements and then the Q&A. So first, uh, oh, that's you. <laughs> <laughs> let's, uh, let's introduce our speakers. All right, so first we have uh, Stephen. Uh, Stephen will be arguing for the God of Christianity and his existence. Uh, he works to connect the challenges of following Jesus, the logical reasons for believing in Jesus, and viewing all life through a biblical framework. Currently, Stephen works at, at the Director of Spiritual Life at Oakland Christian School in Auburn Hills, Michigan, uh, chairs the Bible Department, and teaches high school theology and apologetics. Uh, he attended Monday Moody Theological Seminary and graduated with a Master's of Theology in 2010. Since then, Stephen has authored two books, which are both available on the tables outside these doors. Uh, uh, they are called Marked, Discovering What It Means to Follow Jesus, and the other one is Reasons for Christian Hope. Uh, so if you're interested, definitely let them know. 
um, and served as a general editor for a student book project, uh, Certain Erasing Doubts of the Christian Faith. Currently, Stephen is pursuing a second master's in apologetics from Viola University and is part of the adjunct facility at Grace College. You can find his website at stephenkozak.com. That's K-O-Z-A-K.com. So, thank you very much for having me. Thank you. And then on the other side, we have Justin Schieber. He will be arguing that the Christian God does not exist. Justin was raised a believing Christian until his mid-teens when he was forced to take up intellectual arms as a good Christian soldier should against his own growing doubts. Justin lost that battle. Now Justin is a co-host of the Reasonable Doubts podcast at doubtcast.org and an active member of the Center for Inquiry Michigan. Justin enjoys promoting a friendly yet firm skepticism towards religious claims. Justin has lectured on the philosophical arguments for and against the existence of God and has participated in several debates with Christian apologists, most of which can be found online. Okay, so we're going to begin with uh, Stephen and your opening statements. Well, thank you. Uh, thank you to Justin for inviting me to Secular Student Alliance. Um, and thank you all for coming. Like, like they said, you know, when I asked, I didn't know exactly how much was going to, or how many were going to attend. Uh, this is a fantastic turnout. To think about and talk about one of the most fundamental and important questions, I think, in life. Throughout history, the question of God, in any capacity, has really taken center stage in the public square. Sometimes it evokes frustration, sometimes joy, purpose, sometimes hatred. But the question remains of supreme importance. So I want to offer tonight three reasons, although basic, but that Christian theism is the more plausible worldview. See, the question of existence has been and continues to be one of the most fundamental questions throughout human history. How did all that we see come into existence? We see the question come to life in science, religion, and even literature. So naturally, it's with existence that I'd like to begin tonight. So I want you to imagine for a moment that a loud bang just occurred outside the doors of this room, enough to interrupt tonight's discussion. Many, if not all of us, will be asking the question, well, what was that? Well, where did it come from? Was the noise an explosion? Was it an object that fell? Or some other cause? Well, I believe the no this notion holds true for the universe as well. It's natural for us to ask, where did all this come from? How did we get here? See, everything that has an explanation, or there's an explanation for everything that exists. And in this case, I want to assert that the best explanation for the existence of the universe is, in fact, God. Many in search of an explanation of the universe might simply declare that nothing has caused the universe. It just popped into existence, almost as if the Big Bang gathered enough amounts of nothing to suddenly create something in an unprecedented, cataclysmic event. However, if somehow the world started with nothing, out of nothing, we would continue to have nothing. Because naturally, out of nothing, nothing comes. See, but we're not just speaking about nothing in terms of an empty space, because even a space which appears to have nothing is still something. Nothingness is the absence of even space itself. No properties, nothing at all to measure. But clearly, we have something. It might be really cool to even have a round of beers just kind of pop into existence right here, right now, and we'd all have a party, and it'd be great. But none of us would be justified in believing that to happen, no matter how long we waited. Even philosopher, philosopher Russell Standard comments, it seems to be that as soon as something exists, then it calls for an explanation. Whereas the state of nothingness does not require an explanation. So it's clearly not true of things in the universe, so we can assume that it's not true of the universe itself. So that leaves us with only two options left for how the universe came about. Either one, the universe um, has always somehow existed, always been here, or two, it began to exist through an originating and sustaining cause beyond the constraints of space and time. Well, first, could the universe be infinite? That is, it's always existed. And through a series of random mutations, intelligent human life transformed into what we know it as today? Well, it sounds reasonable enough, but it really ends up falling short of a logical explanation. For example, if in fact the universe did not begin to exist, and therefore not requiring a cause for it, then an infinite number of past events would have preceded this event tonight. 
But the problem is, is that infinity is just really an idea or a potential number. It's not an actual. It's only an idea in our minds and not considered a physical number. But what happens when we try to add or subtract from infinity? Well, we're left with no more and no less than what we started with. In other words, no matter how much you add or take away, we are still left with infinity. Well, this is logically unacceptable. For if we try to capture enough finite moments in time and attempt to reach infinity, we'll never get there. So we would never have reached this event tonight. German mathematician David Hilbert noted that the infinite is nowhere to be found in reality. It neither exists in nature nor provides a legitimate basis for rational thought. The role that remains for the infinite to play is solely that of an idea. So this leads with the third option, that the universe began to exist. If the universe began to exist, then we must have an originating cause. Further, this cause must be beyond anything we can imagine. It must be eternal, spaceless, timeless, and incredibly powerful, and personal so as to cause such a vast universe to come into existence. And I want to look at three reasons to demonstrate that this is the case. First, the cause of, the, of, of a finite universe must be something infinite, beyond something beyond space and time, some kind of prior state of affairs to the universe, some kind of uncaused causer. Second, if such a vast universe is going to be caused, then its originating cause must have a significant and sufficient amount of power to have created something without any pre-existing material. And third, this cause must be personal. Everything in the universe is, is considered contingently existent. That is, its existence is dependent upon some other force or being. So the universe, also contingent, must have been caused by something that is necessarily existent. That is, something or someone that exists in and of itself, or uncaused. Well, there are only two things that we know of that can fall into this category. An abstract object, like numbers, or some kind of personal mind. Well, an abstract object can't create anything, or cause anything to exist. So we're only left with the possibility of a personal mind who created the universe. So to summarize my first argument, premise one, everything that comes into existence has an originating cause that explains its existence. Premise two, the universe began to exist. Therefore, the universe has an originating cause that is eternal, all-powerful, as well as personal. Second, the moral argument. Pick up any book on the history of Nazi Germany and the concentration camps and treatment of Jewish women and children and the other various evils caused by Nazi Germany. Stories about such event and others like it often bring us to tears, leaving us seeking justice in the face of evil that defies human explanation. But what reason do we have for such a declaration? What reason do we have for demanding, a, demanding justice in the face of evil? How is it that we can make such a judgment regarding what is good or evil? To do so, we must declare a worldview that accounts for the origin, existence, and knowledge of this good and evil. We need a worldview that provides motivation to oppose evil and pursue good. But can we say that objective moral values exist? Well, philosopher and mathematician Bertrand Russell said that man had invented various devices for causing the individual self-interest to be in harmony with the herd. Philosopher Michael Ruse said that morality is just an aid to survival and reproduction. But these views do nothing to describe why humanity cries out when children are forced to carry weapons as soldiers or little girls sold into sex slavery. According to Ruse and Russell, our moral duty would be to simply do what's best for ourselves and our community and keep peace with as many people as possible. The atheistic worldview offers nothing in the way of explaining this need for justice and the pursuit of good. Even Friedrich Nietzsche, in his emphatic declaration that God is dead, knew that with God's death came the death of objective value, meaning, and significance. He knew its implications, and he knew that life would have to be redefined and even repurposed. From the atheistic perspective, then, humans should be considered nothing more than higher-functioning animals, and we should be held to the same moral standard as any other animal, survival, instinct, and reproduction. So then the idea of morality really has no meaning. Therefore, there is no murder, and there is no rape. But still, many have tried to argue the presence of relative morality, that because there are differences in opinion about all sorts of laws and ideological systems, then we are not in a position to impose one cultural value or moral over and above another. In this case, social systems are responsible for creating moral standards and really nothing more. Well, at first glance, this seems to make some sense. 
There are many customs and practices considered part of the social norm in one culture and considered obscene in another. But think, however, what this implies. In a piece entitled Self-Definition Morality, former president of Planned Parenthood suggested that her career in motherhood was dedicated to passing on a legacy of tolerance to her daughter, and that, quote, men and women of America are demanding that they be allowed to mold their lives not at the arbitrary command of the church or state, but as their conscience and judgment may dictate. She goes on to say, when others try to inflict their views on me, my daughter, or anyone else, that's not morality, it's tyranny, and it's un-American. Well, this is well written and very, very persuasive, but she does assume a sort of new, neutral moral high ground. In doing so, she desires that we respect each other's views, but anyone who disagrees with her is un-American and tyrannous. But despite her insistence in a subjective standard, she is convincing people to, to adhere to an objective standard the one that she came up with. Well, what should be obvious here is that in a world of moral relativism, achieving true neutrality finds its moral hero in a sociopath, one who lacks the conscience that the rest of us have. This is the only way one can achieve true moral neutrality because morals really no longer matter. So then what happens when two imposing worlds collide? When the plane slammed into the World Trade Center towers, most of us, if not all of us, cried out that a severe injustice had been done. Who's right? Who's wrong? So where does God come in in all of this? How then can those responsible for the deaths of over 3,000 innocent lives be held accountable if we do not maintain some sort of absolute moral standard? If we somehow choose ourselves to be the means by which we measure morality, well then we're, not, we're left with nothing to measure. For example, suppose that little Johnny had never seen a ruler, and his teacher gave him a homework assignment to go home and measure himself, but he had never seen a ruler, he doesn't know what to do, so he decides to use himself, to measure himself. So he goes back to school and tells his teacher that he's one Johnny Tall. Do we really have any information on how tall he is? Well, of course not. This doesn't make any sense. The measuring rod must be independent of the thing being measured. Otherwise, we have nothing to measure. The same can be said of morality. We cannot be ourselves the means by which we measure our own morality. We must look beyond ourselves to something greater. We need something beyond the created order, something beyond space and time, something personal that serves as the ultimate standard and judge for morality. So morality without the reality of God really becomes a larger problem for the atheist. Without God, there is no moral standard. Without a moral standard, there's no means of measuring morality. Without the means which, in which to measure morality, there's nothing left to measure. Therefore, morals really do not exist. Apologist and theologian Douglas Griffiths suggested that since there is no objective moral meaning or value, there is no possibility of moral reasoning. Individuals are left to create morality on the basis of anything, or in fact nothing. So to summarize my moral argument, premise one, if a personal God does not exist, then objective moral values do not exist. Well, objective moral values do exist, therefore God exists. And lastly, the resurrection of Jesus. The resurrection of Jesus is the most critical of all of the evidence because for the Christian, everything hinges on the resurrection. If Jesus is not raised from the dead, Christianity is not a viable worldview option whatsoever. New Testament scholar and historian N.T. Wright noted, the resurrection of Jesus offers itself to the student of history or science no less than the Christian or theologian, not as an odd event within the world, as it is, but the utterly characteristic, prototypical, and foundational event within the world as it has begun to be, not as an absurd event within the old world, but the symbol and starting point of a new world. It can be said with near absolute certainty, among scholars both Christians and not, that Jesus was in fact crucified under the Roman government sometime around 30 or 33 AD. While it's clear there's a wide variety of scholarship in this area, the historical person of Jesus of Nazareth traveled first century Palestine as a Jewish rabbi, and because of the perceived threat he had in the Jewish religion and the peace of the Roman Empire, he was crucified. Whether biblical scholars or historians, the investigation of the person of Jesus has resulted in almost unanimous consent. But I want to take these accepted points one step further, and I want to offer three simple yet key pieces of evidence that provides more than enough reason to assert that Jesus resurrected from the dead three days after being crucified and buried, and thereby affirming his claim to be God. 
Number one, the discovery of the empty tomb. I believe that Dr. William Lane Craig correctly states that the historical credibility of the story of Jesus' burial does support an empty tomb. It would have been strictly followed custom to ensure that the body was properly prepared and placed in a tomb prior to the Sabbath, which began at sundown on Friday. Jesus' body would have been wrapped in roughly 100 pounds of linens and spices and then placed in a tomb that was guarded by Roman soldiers. More so, this empty tomb was discovered by women. Now, to appreciate the thrust of this fact, you got to understand that the role of women in Jewish society is critical. A woman's testimony was never, at any time, considered valid. If the early disciples were trying to fabricate a story, women discovered in the empty tomb would not have been the means to do that. If the tomb had not been empty, the preaching of the apostles could have, and most likely would have, been stopped by simply producing a dead body. If Jesus was the threat that Rome and the Jews thought he was, it was in their best interest to produce a body and put down any unneeded political unrest. Thus, the need for the tomb to be guarded. Further, if Jesus had been killed and buried in a tomb and left there, it would have been stream extremely likely that the tomb would have been venerated as that of a saint. This custom would explain why the women were at the tomb in the first place, preparing the site for later tribute. Further, Jews, in hopes of a future resurrection, would preserve the bones of loved ones in ossuary boxes, and yet we have no such box. Number two, the historical accounts of post-mortem appearances of Jesus. I think the most compelling witness of the resurrection of Jesus is the Apostle Paul. But I want to make sure I know that when I consider the evidence available from the biblical text, I am not taking the Bible as the inspired Word of God, only as a historical document recognized by a wide, wide range of scholars, both Christians and non, biblical scholars as well as historians. So Paul's first letter to the church in Corinth describes the various appearances of the risen Jesus in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 1-8. through 8. Paul's authorship of the letter is undisputed among scholars, and in this passage Paul is invoking an already existing creed of the church. The letter was drafted in the middle 50s AD and is known to be the earliest account of the resurrection. Historians have also determined that since Paul mentions Peter and James as witnesses to the resurrection, by, uh, and Paul met with and received this info from, from them some years earlier, it is likely by most historical accounts that this creed dates as far back as the 30s AD, right on top of the event. This information is well attested among scholars from all spectrums. Even the well-known atheist New Testament critic Gerd Ludemann comments, I do insist, however, that the discovery of pre-Pauline confessional formulations is one of the great achievements of recent New Testament scholarship. So what this shows is that the affirmation of the resurrection was established a short time after the event and added to the early community's fundamental beliefs. Further, it disproves the resurrection as a much later developed legend. Instead, the, witness, the witnesses that Paul speaks of were alive and available for questioning. Therefore, it seems clear that Paul was recording what he received from the earliest eyewitness disciples closest to Jesus. And finally, the transformation of the early disciples. The historical record of the early Christians illustrates the group of people who, upon the crucifixion of Jesus, fled from fear of their own lives. That is, until they believed he resurrected and appeared to them. The attitude of the Christians after they had allegedly witnessed a divine miracle became bold proclaimers of the gospel. There is no doubt that they believed Jesus had resurrected and willingly endangered themselves and suffered at times brutal deaths. They lived, as the first century Roman historian Tacitus noted, enemies of the human race. If the resurrection did not happen, then scholars need to derive the reasons for the rapid growth of Christianity across the ancient world. How could the disciples of Jesus, who did not understand or even conceive of the idea of a resurrection of one man, who could not stand by the side of Jesus risking their own lives while Rome took his, suddenly braved persecution, declaring that Jesus had indeed risen from the dead? The earliest and most consistent message of the early church to today has been grounded in the resurrection of Jesus. So, to summarize my arguments... First, a personal, spaceless, timeless, and all-powerful mind is the best explanation for the existence of the universe, which we call God. The objective moral values that we all share illustrates the necessity for a standard beyond ourselves, a someone that serves uh, as a giver and judge of this moral law, which we call God. 
And finally, Jesus of Nazareth lived a sinful life of miracles, asserting that he was, in fact, this same God. This claim was then verified by being resurrected from the dead, whom we call God. Therefore, I continue to assert that the belief in the Christian God is the more plausible worldview. Thank you. Sutliff and the Secular Student Alliance uh, here at Ferris State University for inviting me to participate in tonight's debate, uh, and I'm happy to be sharing the stage with, um, with uh, author and Christian apologist Stephen Kozak, um, and I want to thank all of you guys for coming, uh, for putting down the controls to Grand Theft Auto V, even if it's <laughs> just for a few hours, uh, and, and coming to an event that I think uh, the kinds of which don't happen nearly enough. Um, and so I'm delighted to be here with you today. Now, while it is true that, that Stephen and I disagree on some of the most basic, fundamental questions that one could possibly ask themselves, I, I find myself in complete agreement with him when he writes in his most recent book, quote, No matter how we wish to look at or define reality to suit our own experience and our needs, there are always consequences to getting it wrong. And I think he's absolutely right about that. See, I used to believe in everything Mr. Kozak believes. I read my Bible regularly. I felt absolutely certain that I had a profound relationship with Jesus Christ. It was hauntingly real to me. Eventually, my mind started to have doubts. I tried to resist these doubts uh, by reading apologetic authors like uh, Lee Strobel and, and C.S. Lewis. But once I began to, cre to, to once I began to critique those arguments, uh, I soon began to learn that that the evidence just isn't with Christianity. That was very surprising to me, and, and also very disturbing. Tonight I hope to make it abundantly clear that a proper dose of reason urges us to abandon this ancient yet rich tradition. Now there are several ways that one might argue against the existence of a particular God. One of those ways is to argue that this particular concept of God is, is logically incompatible with some feature of reality. We might call these this the deductive approach. Uh, another way is to argue that the existence of God is very improbable, given some features of the world. And, and we might want to call this the uh, evidential or probabilistic approach. I'll be using both of those approaches tonight. The deductive will be first. Christianity holds that there is a God who exists causally, but not necessarily temporally, prior to the existence of the universe. It is the theologians and the philosophers among them that tell us that God is to be properly understood as a maximally great being. One rather trivial point that can stand as a commonality between Stephen and I is, is that we both believe that the uh, universe exists. <laughs> That's something that we have in common. Uh, the reality of the universe, of course, is, and the objects within it are just too obvious to deny. However, I want to argue that a Christian's belief in the existence of a universe and their belief in God stand in an uncomfortable relationship with each other. That there exists a tension between these two beliefs once the concept of a maximally great being is taken to its logical conclusion. Because God is to be understood as a maximally great being, he must, uh, he must be absolutely and essentially perfect, both morally and ontologically. But what is meant by ontological perfection? Well, there are things called great making properties. And things like power, being loving, and having knowledge. <laughs> and God, if he exists, has these properties to their respective maximal degrees. The words of Christian philosopher J.P. Moreland can help shed some light on this. J.P. says, quote, To say that God is perfect means that there is no possible world where he has his attributes to a greater degree. God is not the most loving being that happens to exist, but rather he is the most loving being that could possibly exist. So that God's possessing the attribute of being loving is to a degree such that it is impossible for him to have it to a greater degree. So the question before us tonight uh, is, if the Christian God were to exist, would he have motivating reasons to intentionally create anything? The theist only has one option here, of course. He must answer yes, because after all, the theist also accepts that the universe exists. However, I want to argue that that theists should answer this question in the negative, that God, if he existed, could not have motivating reasons to create anything, let alone an entire universe and populate it in the ways that, 
we see it to be populated with. The argument involves the term God world. And no, this is not a theme park. Uh, rather, uh, for our purposes here, let God world refer to that possible world where God exists alone and nothing else exists for eternity. Of course, to say that God world is, is a possible world just means that it's a way that reality could have been, even if it is not the way that reality actually is. So, um, of course, this argument takes for granted that uh, God's creation act was indeed a free act and not born of necessity. So the argument goes as follows. <laughs> Premise one, if the Christian God exists, then God world is the unique best possible world. Premise two, if God world is the unique best possible world, then the Christian God would maintain God world. Premise three, God world is false because the universe does exist. Therefore, the Christian God, as so defined, does not exist. Now, this argument sure seems valid, but is it sound? Are the premises true? Premise one, if the Christian God exists, then God world is the best possible world. Why I think that this premise should be true? Well, if God exists, remember, he is the best possible being, meaning that he has all those great making properties to their maximal degrees and no such properties to any lesser degree. Now, a world composed entirely of this single best possible being, existing alone for eternity, would be a world composed entirely of all the great making properties to their maximal degrees, and no such properties to any lesser degree. Now, unless, of course, there is some unique source of goodness, uh, goodness that exists outside of and fully independent of God, which I think we've just heard that uh, Stephen would not accept, then God world must be the unique best possible world. Premise two. If God world is the unique best possible world, then the Christian God would maintain or preserve God world. I think that this is true. Well, if God exists, and he is truly the maximally great being that the philosophical theologians hold him to be, then he would be surely aware of the fact that himself existing alone for eternity, as God world, is the best possible world that could ever exist. And because God is essentially morally perfect, he couldn't have a motivating reason to intentionally uh, alter the overall quality of that maximally great state of affairs. Because any alteration, of course, uh, of the overall quality would by necessity be a degradation of the overall quality. A maximally great being such as God would sustain the beautiful eternal tone of perfection. God would not introduce limited entities, each with their un own unimpressive set of degraded great-making properties, like the creation myth of Genesis holds, uh, where we have God creating Adam and Eve. Um, now, of course, surely... Uh, um, Adam and Eve have great making properties, but they have them to a limited degree. They have knowledge, but it's limited. They have power, but it's very limited. Um, and so this can't be seen as anything other than a degradation of the overall quality of that possible reality. Any plausible conception of what it means to be a maximally great being uh, has us thinking that God would maintain and preserve God's world because to suggest that God is in the degrading business is to suggest that he was never maximally great in the first place. Premise three, God world is false because the universe exists. Well, I shouldn't really have to justify that premise. And conclusion, therefore, the Christian God does not exist. Um, now, I do want to anticipate one possible objection to this argument before moving on. Perhaps the theist um, responds by saying, well, my view of God has him caring, caring more about the actualization of the greatest number of goods um, of great making properties in the world, even if such properties aren't to their maximal possible degrees. My God is that way. God isn't concerned about the purity or the quality of the overall properties that actually exist. He merely wants to multiply them, quality be damned. But this kind of di divine promiscuity uh, strikes me as extraordinarily implausible. If this objector and others like him get to use their kind of moral intuitions as guides to what uh, kinds of properties count as great making, then they can't consistently shy away from the fact that to sacrifice quality on the altar of quantity is something that we all intuit as an imperfection. Everybody uh, intuits this. Theists and non-theists are in common ground in recognizing that it is far better to desire one extraordinarily high quality relationship for the remainder of our, remainder of our lives than to have a maximal number of short flings of very poor quality. Manufacturing managers will tell you that there's little uh, value in doubling production when you triple the nonconformities. Moreover, without independent justification for thinking that a maxim maximally great being 
if, if, if he existed, that he would desire quality over quantity, this response would be gratuitously ad hoc in the most transparent way. Now for my next argument, I will be using the evidential approach. But let's not get ahead of ourselves. What is evidence? Well, Colin Helson, philosopher of science, writes, quote, to say that a body of information is evidence in favor of a hypothesis is to say that a hypothesis receives some degree of support, confirmation from that information. So your cookie jar is unexpectedly empty, so you hypothesize that your roommate uh, stole the cookies. Now, if later that day you observe your roommate uh, with crumbs on his face, uh, then this new observation would, of course, lend, uh, lend strong support to your hypothesis, because now your hypothesis is more probable than it would be if it were standing alone. The hypothesis with the new evidence makes it more probable than if it were uh, standing alone. Um, so the, my next argument is the problem of evil or suffering. This is an evidence-based argument against the existence of a being who is omnipotent, omniscient, and omnibenevolent, essentially God. Now, it is my claim that the number and degree of geographic er, and geographic distribution of instances of suffering constitutes very strong evidence against the existence of a God as just defined. In Uganda, an, organ an organized gang of chimpanzees suddenly attacks and inflicts extreme violence on another lone chimp who has wandered into their territory. They close in with a screaming frenzy biting, kicking, and inflicting powerful blows, causing horrific injury to the immobilized chimp until at last nature shows a bit of sympathy and allows him to die after, pure, after several minutes of, of pure torture. Now, thanks to University of Michigan behavioral, primate behavioral ecologist John Mattini and his tenure study of the chimp community in Uganda, we now have definitive evidence that bands of chimpanzees violently kill individuals from neighboring groups in order to expand their own territory and, and secure additional resources. Even isolated instances of cannibalism have been observed in these Ugandan tribes. Now, there's very little difference, of course, between us and the chimpanzees and, and other great apes. Chimpanzees, our closest cousins, are highly intelligent social animals and are especially sensitive to physical and emotional pain. Like humans, they exhibit a range of emotions, including pleasure, deep depression, pain, empathy, and grief. Now, why would a loving God allow this kind of violence to happen to these chimps? If God is all-knowing, he must surely know about the evils and the suffering, so that can't really be an excuse, and he's all-powerful, so that can't be either. And if he's good, it sure seems like he would want to prevent these sufferings. More, um, but I do want to give uh, the man upstairs a bit of a break here. I do, we do have a history, so I, I feel obligated <laughs> on that end. Um, I'm perfectly willing to grant that God may have reasons for allowing certain evils or instances of suffering to occur in the actual world, after all, it seems plausible uh, to me that if God exists, God may have reasons for allowing some evils to ensure some greater goods to occur. But, and this is important, a perfectly loving God would never allow an instance of evil or an instance of suffering unless it was logically necessary for bringing about some greater good. That is to say that if God exists, then every instance of suffering is permitted, that is permitted, is, is permitted for a very good reason. If God exists, there are, there are no unnecessary evils or sufferings. But, many, but, but of course, many of these evils and sufferings, uh, ranging from uh, people like um, Jeffrey Dahmer and his victims, and uh, you have Ariel Castro and the 10-year uh, horrific captivity that those uh, young women went through, um, clearly there are some instances of suffering that seem like they have no justification. It seems like they, they do, they, God could have prevented them without, uh, without avoiding or without missing out on some greater good. And I think that that fact should lead a rational person to say that probably some instances of suffering aren't just confusing or mysterious, but that at least some evils or instances of suffering are actually gratuitous. And so to the degree that they are probably gratuitous, to that degree uh, God probably does not exist, all else being equal. So the argument... Oh, yeah. All right. Um, the argument goes as, as follows. Many evils or uh, sufferings seem gratuitous, uh, purposeless, and, un and unnecessary. Um, premise two, probably at least one of those evils or sufferings actually is gratuitous. Premise three, if the Christian God exists, it would not permit any gratuitous evils or sufferings. A conclusion, all else being equal, probably God does not exist. Now, perhaps you're thinking... Not so fast. 
You can't go from the mere fact that many instances of evil seem like they have no justification to the conclusion that therefore probably at least one has no justification. However, I disagree. We make these kinds of inductive inferences all the time, and we are perfectly rational in doing so. For example, suppose that after searching my entire house, I cannot seem to find a fully grown adult elephant. I don't know why I would be doing that, but let's avoid that for now. Um, naturally enough, I would infer that there probably isn't one there. Now, I take it that nobody in this room would find that to be an irrational inference. And so for the same reason, nobody should find that conclusion that probably at least one of these instances of suffering is actually gratuitous, especially given the number of apparently gratuitous sufferings. And so in the words of uh, philosopher Robert Bass of UNC, quote, evil counts against the existence of God just as crabgrass on the Gulf Green counts against the existence of an efficient greenskeeper. My third argument is not so much of an argument against the existence of God, rather it is an argument in anticipation of a popular response to the evidential problem of evil that I just presented. Essentially, I want to force my opponent to either accept that the vast number of seemingly gratuitous suffering does indeed constitute very strong evidence against the existence of God, or to accept the position of being unable to know that the central claims of Christianity are actually true. So most of the time, theists will object to the inference that I made between premise 1 and 2 um, of the evidential problem of evil, um, mainly from that there are many apparently gratuitous evils to probably there's at least one of those that is actually gratuitous. Um, they will uh, usually say something like, well, he, if God existed, he would be so far above us uh, and know so much more than us that the mere fact that we can't see any justification for God allowing the vast number of particularly harsh instances of suffering to occur doesn't give us any reason to think that probably at least one lacks justification. After all, the script would go, seemingly unjustified suffering is only evidence against God if we should expect to be able to understand God's reasons for allowing the things that he does. And no sensible Christian would make such a claim. For all we know, God, had, God has reasons for allowing things that we simply don't understand. Now, a number of theistic philosophers have advanced this response to arguments similar to mine. So people like Alvin Plantinga, Stephen Weibstra, and William Lane Craig. Now, if this statement is true, then I must agree that it does seem to avoid the central inference in the evidential problem of evil, because it says that all things considered, we're simply in no position to place probabilities on whether or not God has a justification for allowing particular evils. However, if this is, if this is the kind of epistemic humility one should expect given the existence of, of the Christian God, then a significant problem enters the picture. Speaking of the implications of this view, philosopher Eric Wielenberg writes, quote, We seem to be in the dark when it, comes to, when it comes to determining the likelihood of the existence of some spectacularly grand good that is connected with divine lying in such a way as to justify it, unquote. Um, and so, okay, here we are. Uh, premise one, if the Christian God exists, then he has exhaustive knowledge of all, of all moral goods, evils, and entailment relationships between them. Premise two, we limited human beings have no good reason for thinking that our knowledge of the goods, evils, and entailment relationships between them is even slightly representative of the relationships of the goods, evils, and, and relationships between them that actually exist. Premise three, if one and two, then we are in no position to place probabilities on whether there is a beyond our understanding justification for God's lying to us in asserting D, D being some uh, biblical assertion, uh, and conclusion, if we are in no position to place probabilities on whether there is a beyond our understanding justification for God's lying to us and asserting D, then we do not know any proposition that has biblical justification only. This argument shows that while Christians can surely, ex can surely be invited to believe in the truth value of propositions that have biblical justification only, they cannot know these propositions are true because they lack rational justification or warrant. Uh, every biblical divine assertion concerning the necessary and sufficient conditions uh, for one to be saved, uh, and every assertion regarding the salvific significance of uh, the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ uh, falls under those statements that have biblical justification only. Now, if Christians aren't in a place to, if Christians are not in a place to place probabilities on whether or not God has morally sufficient reasons for. Um, beyond their understanding the lie of them, then Christians are in no position to place probabilities on the actual truth claims of these biblical claims, or the truth value of these biblical claims. Mm -hmm. um, okay, uh, 
if that's true, then Christians cannot know that the essentials of Christianity are actually true, or, uh, or cannot know that they're probably true or even probably false. They have to be completely agnostic as to these issues. Uh, the actual truth of what C.S. Lewis deems mere Christianity must be completely unknowable to the Christian thinker. While not necessarily being a problem for justified belief in a God, it is certainly a big problem for justified belief in the Christian view of God, which entails things like the self-ethic significance uh, of the death and resurrection of Jesus and the nature of Jesus and the relationship between him and God. Um, so let's review my arguments. I don't have the time. Thank you. <laughs> try to address all of his arguments. We'll see how much time I have and how, how fast I can move through this. First, let's talk about God's world. Um, but I do want to say, um, and I, I, I mentioned this to somebody before, that I, I do appreciate uh, Justin's arguments in the sense that they are not the arguments that I normally hear from um, non-Christians of really any kind. Um, usually it's just poking fun at uh, what Christians believe, or tearing down Christian arguments rather than constructing their own. So I do appreciate um, Justin's uh, ability to construct some arguments to give this conversation some some uh, some depth. So to begin, let's let's address this question of uh, of God and God world. If God is indeed the greatest possible being that could possibly exist, and I agree with the J.P. Moral, of course. Um, it's the very thing that makes him God, right? The fact that he is who he is. But the idea of God world suggests that because God is such a being that you have no sufficient reason to create anything because you really can't compare to who he is. Well, there's a couple problems I see with this. Well, first, I think it makes an assumption that if God existed, he would not have created anything else. It's really no more than an assumption on who God is, the character of a God, uh, in terms of what we think God might or might not want uh, to create. If God is a maximally great being, then it seems to me that he has the freedom to create what he chooses, so long as it doesn't contradict with his character. Second, we have no reason to believe that God must create or want to create something as unique and as perfect as he is. In fact, to be God, he cannot. The very thing that makes him God is that his creation must be less than he is, not greater than or certainly equal to him. Otherwise, that thing would be called God in some way, shape, or form. A part of God being maximally great is that he is infinite and we are finite. His creation is finite. There exists a distinction between creator and creation. Further, God created what he wanted and doesn't have to be the best possible world, only the world that God wants to create. Justin also states that a world that God creates need to have, needs to have all the same great making properties to the same degree, at least the way, the way I understand it. He further argues and I don't know if he said this tonight, but this is a quote from one of his other um, debates on, 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 uh, on his website. Uh, a world composed entirely of the single best possible being existing alone for eternity would be a world composed entirely of all those great making properties to their maximal composable degrees and no such property to a lesser degree. Now again, while God did not create the world equal to him or to the full capacity of his great making properties, much of the world is designed to reflect God and his nature. God is the most loving being possible, giving humanity the capacity to love. God is the most intelligent being possible, giving humanity the ability to think, create, and innovate. God is the most moral being possible, giving humanity a standard for morality. While creation can't match all of God's great making properties, we certainly possess them in a way that is reflective. He's also said in the past, I don't think, I don't think he said it tonight, but um, is um, unless there is some source of unique goodness, goodness that exists outside of and fully independent of God, then God's world must be the unique best possible world. But again, this is missing the nature and character of God. The unique source of goodness cannot exist independently of God, because God is the source. If God is the means by which the world came into existence, then any standard of goodness that we experience has its origin in God himself. Therefore, although incredibly interesting, and I appreciate the argument, I don't believe that God world um, could, could really exist in any kind of reality whatsoever, and therefore, since we're talking about the universe as it stands now, um, I believe these premises really don't stand. Uh, let's talk about problem of evil. 
Um, for, for purposes tonight, I, I want to I have a point of, of, of significant agreement. I certainly agree that many evils are uh, gratuitous, they're unnecessary. Um, but for tonight, what I want to kind of offer is the idea that that's a bit of a subjective viewpoint. Because when we're talking about suffering, generally we're talking about something very deep and very personal to each and every one of us in whatever capacity. And there could be any one of us at any time experiencing an evil or, or an aspect of suffering that we might think is gratuitous, that we might think is unnecessary. So I want to kind of address that as a kind of a whole thing and just say, you know what, they all could be based on where we are in our current life and what's going on. And I think that's, uh, I think that's something we should all appreciate um, in each other. So I completely exist, obviously, that evil exists. And it exists that many times it seems as though it's unnecessary. And I'm not going to sit here and try to tell you that, well, God has a plan for your life and maybe we just don't know it yet. I'm not going to make that assertion because I don't know that I can show that. And that's not for tonight. But I will say that according to philosopher and professor at Notre Dame, Alvin Plantinga, if a person is free with respect to a particular action, then he has the freedom to perform that action, as well as the freedom to refrain from performing that action. And there's no previous condition or cause that determines the choice. See, God could not have created creatures with the free ability to only choose good. Without the ability to choose evil, how do we know what is good? Our finite minds, even though reflective of God, still need to understand a standard or origin for good and evil. Well, therefore, evil is allowed to exist so that we can be truly free creatures. Plantinga states it this way, and I quote, A world containing creatures who are significantly free is more valuable, all else being equal, than a world containing no free creatures at all. Now, God can create free creatures, but he can't cause or determine them to do only what is right. For if he does so, then they aren't significantly free after all. They do not do what is right freely. To create creatures capable of moral good, therefore, he must create creatures capable of moral evil. And he can't give these creatures the freedom to perform evil and at the same time prevent them from doing so. As it turned out, sadly enough, some of the free creatures God created went wrong in their exercise of their freedom. This is the source of moral evil. The fact that free creatures sometimes go wrong, however, counts neither against God's omnipotence nor against his goodness. For he could not have forestalled the occurrence of moral evil only by removing the possibility of moral good, end quote. I think in this case, whether evil and suffering possesses a divine point really is, I say this gently, irrelevant. What is relevant is that evil and suffering of every kind exists. Mankind's exercise of their freedom has caused evil, and in order to maintain this freedom, God must allow and consequently deal with it as the sole authority and judge for moral behavior. Based on God's ability and need to create morally free creatures and his responsibility to hold his creation to a standard of morality, illustrates clearly that God is in fact a being who is acting in a way that is morally just because he's morally perfect and therefore God exists. Let me touch just for a minute on the, um, the, his, his last argument, the divine lie, uh, whatever you, you want to exactly call it. Um, if I understand it correctly, and, and Justin, you can correct me if I'm way off for some reason or another, um, that Justin is stating that the Christians have really no way of knowing whether God is lying to us or not in the Bible. And as a result, there's really a great possibility or probability that he is, that we, don't, we can't really know what God's up to. God's greater than we are, so how, how, do we, how are we supposed to know? Well, I can agree in part with his premise one and his premise two. God does, in fact, have complete knowledge of good and evil and the entanglement relationships between them. Absolutely. I also agree that in many cases our finite minds do not have the capacity to understand good and evil and to the degree that God does, certainly. But what does not seem to follow is the assumption that God is somehow lying or somehow not telling us the truth, that we somehow cannot know these things. There's just as much of a probability of him telling the truth as there is of him lying. And therefore, I'm not sure the argument holds. Further, this, I think this is applying or a, a simple misunderstanding of the nature of the Christian God. When we speak of God as maximally great being, this includes God's inability to lie, which the scriptural promise of redemption hinges on this fact. One Lastly, second. thank you. 
Lastly, the scriptures are reliable. This means that we know something about God beyond general revelation. We know it through the biblical account. Speaking of the New Testament specifically, we have a greater number, more accurate and reliable accounts of the life of Jesus and early church activities and beliefs than any other document in antiquity. In other words, the information we have in the New Testament documents is accurate and reliable more so than any other historical document of its time. So in combination with extra-biblical accounts of Jesus and his resurrection, the Bible gives us excellent reasons to know that God is telling the truth, that his promises are in fact coming true, and that we have good reason to believe so. So to prove that Mr. Sheep, what Mr. Sheeper needs to do is to provide his own examples of the fact that God is in fact lying, and that we, that we have no good reasons to believe that um, of what God is doing beyond our understanding. Until he does that, I don't think his argument can be considered. Thank you. Provided us with three arguments for the existence of God. Uh, let's examine them in the order that they were presented. So, his first argument, if you recall, uh, was a kind of cosmological argument. Uh, everything that comes into existence has an originating cause that explains its existence. Uh, the universe began to exist, and uh, the conclusion, therefore, the universe has an originating cause that is eternal, all powerful, and personal. I want to suggest that. Premise one is an interesting claim. On the one hand, it seems obviously true, right? Everything that starts to exist does so for a reason, right? Well, that depends on what exactly you mean by coming to existence. For example, a chair comes into existence in the sense that it was built from pre-existing materials. Chairs don't just pop into existence. They're, they're crafted over time, and then at one point, uh, it is a particular way that it deserves a new label, a chair. It doesn't just pop into existence. Everything we know uh, about things coming into existence tells us that they come into existence from pre-existing material reality. Uh, that's just an empirical claim. Um, and so if... Sorry. Uh, if the move from premise one to premise two in this argument is inferring from the general to the particular, then we should conclude that the universe, that the universe's existence, came about from a causally prior, primitive form of material reality, perhaps a spaceless, timeless point, or a quantum field. Um, people um, like Quentin Smith have argued that the universe does come from a, a spaceless, timeless point, um, now, if this is the inference being made here, then I really don't have any problem with that. Um, I don't really see how that could possibly justify the conclusion to the argument. But I would have no problem with the premises, as, as stated. Um, however, given Stephen's presentation of premise two, he seems to have an implicit assumption that there was nothing before this point, or that, it, that it came from no, it wasn't created like a chair is out of material reality, rather it was created out of nothing, and that that begs for an explanation, um, and so we would have a transcendent reality uh, causing that thing to uh, come into existence out of nothing. Um, but this conclusion looks more like theology rather than a conclusion based in science. The, the most scientists can say about the beginning of the universe is that our space-time universe cannot have been expanding infinitely into the past. But I think, but, but think about it, this does not entail that the universe had a beginning of its very existence, only that it had a, only that its period of expansion had a beginning. It might be that the universe, for example, had a, an initial timeless state, and perhaps um, that timeless state exists necessarily. Um, the, the truth is, we just don't know these things. And to kind of speculate about the beginning of the universe, I think, is, is not only scientifically troublesome, uh, but, but philosophically, it, it just seems to violate uh, just good, rigorous philosophical thought. Like I said, we just don't know. Um, for example, general relativity, the understanding, the theory underlying the, the Big Bang theory, we know it's incomplete. Uh, we don't have an understanding of quantum gravity yet. 
So anything described by general relativity uh, before the first Planck second, um, should, we should really be treating as an unknown. Uh, I think it's, it's, we're just not really justified in kind of coming up with these grand theories. Um, now, so the conclusion, the conclusion of the argument, the universe has an originating cause that is eternal, all-powerful, and personal. Um, I just don't see how this follows um, from the argument. Uh, maybe I'm missing something, but I just, I just don't see how that follows. Um, as theoretical physicist at Caltech, Sean Carroll put it, quote, the singularity of the Big Bang does not indicate a beginning to the universe. It only indicates an end to our theoretical comprehension. Um, the moral argument. If objective moral values do not exist, then God does not exist. Premise two, objective moral values do exist, therefore God exists. First of all, um, before I address what I think Stephen is arguing here, I think it should be noted that the argument is invalid um, and therefore unsound. Uh, the conclusion does not follow from the premises. Uh, nothing about the claim uh, that a lack of moral values entails a lack of God means that the existence of moral values entails the existence of God. Uh, this is a formal fallacy called uh, denying the antecedent. Um, but I think I know what Mr. Kozak is trying to get at here. Um, and I think you do too. Um, among some moral issues, there, are, there seems to be a wide uh, moral agreement. And in many cases, these moral positions were reached independently of others. Um, for instance, charity is very good, torture is very bad. Um, now, if we grant the premise that this can be a good guide to truth, then the independent attestation is, I think, strong evidence in favor that, uh, of some form of, of moral realism. How best are we to make sense of this, though? Stephen Kozak seems to be arguing that, uh, that the God of the Bible uh, is the only suitable ontological grounding, or at least the most plausible, uh, more plausible than not, um, ontological grounding for the existence of these moral facts. But think about this. I mean, clearly the claim which asserts that these obvious moral facts are grounded in the biblical God, or are grounded in anything, rather, um, at the very least must be sensitive to whether or not the entity you're positing acts in a way consistent with those moral values that we all hold dear. Now, the God of the Bible commands the genocide of men, women, and children simply because their ancestors attacked Israel on the way out of Egypt 400 years prior to that. I'm talking about the Amalekite genocide. Uh, Saul failed in his job to exterminate the Amalekites. Um, and so uh, God wasn't happy with him. He didn't kill enough men, women, and children. And so he lost his job. Saul was no longer there. And so that's when Israel erected the monarchy. Um, but, I mean, so, so think about this. This is the, the claim we're, we're, we're being told to think about, that what makes sense of our moral intuitions is a being who is capable of that. Now let me ask you, if a being being good is consistent with commanding such things as that, and with permitting slavery, and not outlawing it, but rather just regulating it. If that's really consistent with what goodness is, then I'm sorry, I have no idea what the hell goodness means anymore. And I don't think any of you do either. Sometimes I'm just baffled at these claims. What does it mean to say that God plausibly grounds moral values if he, <laughs> if he proudly and boastfully violates them at every, seemingly every moment he has available to him in the Old Testament. Argument three, uh, the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Uh, this was an abductive argument um, which, in which he listed uh, three main facts and uh, says that the best explanation of these three facts is that, uh, how, much, how much time do I got? All right. Um, <laughs> That the best explanation of these, of these three facts is that uh, God raised Jesus from the dead. Now, on page 222 of Lee Strobel's A Case for Christ, one of the very first apologetic books I ever owned, um, 
we read, uh, William Lane Craig is, is quoted as saying, quote, any hypothesis would be more probable than saying that the corpse of Jesus spontaneously came back to life. But the hypothesis that God raised Jesus from the dead doesn't contradict science or any known facts of experience. And listen to what he says here. This is extremely important. All it requires is a hypothesis that God exists. And I think there are good independent reasons for thinking that he does. Now, Craig is certainly right. That the plausibility of the hypothesis that God raised Jesus from the dead will, of course, hinge on whether or not there are strong independent reasons for God's existence. If you're like me and you feel that the arguments for God's existence are extremely weak, uh, then obviously any even far-fetched naturalistic explanation is just going to be a better explanation. Now notice, though, that this is not dogmatic. This is not a dogmatic rejection of miracles. Rather, it's a recognition that one's epistemic probability uh, of a hypothesis is going to be sensitive to one's background knowledge. That is to say that my plausi my, uh, the plausibility of the resurrection to me is of course going to be contingent on whether or not I think that a God exists, or whether or not there are supernatural agents interacting with the world in, in such a way as to uh, rate... Uh, all right. Um, yeah, thanks. <laughs> I'm terrible at things. <laughs> All right. All right. Now, uh, what I think is going to be my favorite part, uh, the cross-examination. Uh, all right, Steve. Right. You have eight minutes for cross-examination, and it begins now. All right. Um, well, I want to start with just um, maybe some clarification questions to make sure, sure. I understand some things correctly. Um, can you help me with the connection that you make between... Um, who God is in terms of character, because it does seem very much like in your first argument from non-God objects that much of what you're asserting is more directed at God's character, who you think God might be, or what he might want to do, um, versus what he is able to do. Now, that could be just my misunderstanding, um, but um, can you make that connection between who God is, in your mind, based on this argument, and his need and desire to only have this world in which he's the only thing or entity that exists rather than create anything at all. Um, sure. Please. Yeah, go ahead. Um, yeah, so uh, the arguments, um, as with anything when we talk about maximally great beings, um, as, as you're aware, the ontological argument, um, we feel, or uh, philosophical theologians feel perfectly uh, within their rights to... Uh, to put some flesh on these claims, right? So a morally good being, uh, a morally perfect being, rather, would be a being who um, kind of fulfills those things that we all kind of intuit as moral perfections um, in, in each other. Uh, and we would kind of extrapolate those and be like, well, a person who's like this uh, is like God, or is God would be like that because that's just something that humanity could never aspire to, but we still think of that as a noble goal. Um, and so I think that I think that appealing to intuitions like this is a perfectly legitimate way to flesh out um, what we could think of God as plausibly doing um, if it's the case that we're going to allow the same thing to people who are using arguments like the ontological argument. Um, so, given that, uh, the, the claim that God would never want to create anything, that's a claim about um, God preferring um, the quality of a state of affairs rather than the quantity. So. Um, by introducing anything that's not God, of course, anything that's not maximally extended would be to uh, degrade the overall quality. And I don't think a good God would do that. I think a perfect God uh, would preserve the pure quality rather than introducing new numbers of properties, bringing down the overall quality. Does that make sense? Yeah, it, what I'm wondering is, and I, 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 this is going to sound bad to some people in the room, but I hate to bring theology into it. Um, too much, but I do want I do want to see what your response would be to um, the maybe the Christian response to that beyond an apologetic discussion might be well God did create what we might call the best possible world, and in terms of Genesis, Adam and Eve, the garden, mm -hmm. um, in terms of even how Christians understand heaven being the presence of God, that would be as close to or as as like heaven as one could get before the end of all things, according to the Christian view. 
um, that God did create that, but in order to create morally free creatures, he has to create them with the ability to do wrong. Therefore, they did. Therefore, they have the punishment. Therefore, we're in our, our state now. How then would you respond to, to the basic Christian response sure. to that? Sure. Well, um, I guess, first of all, I would say, well, then God would create other things that are like God. Of course, they would be different beings, that they would be necessary beings, they'd be contingent beings. Um, but it wouldn't make any sense for God to create human beings who are limited in knowledge. Like, why would he need to limit them in knowledge? If, if the value of things is what's important to God, then God would make their, their great making properties of knowledge to their infinite degrees, to their maximal degrees, their, their, their power to their maximal degrees. But doesn't that make them God and then no longer can God Well, what's God? the problem with that? Why not more God properties, right? Like, I think that there's a theological assumption that God needs to uh, kind of be boastful and, and keep everyone away from him. And, and, and like, I, I just think say, that that's Yeah, I, I, see what you're I wouldn't say keep everything away from him, but in terms keep of... Keep everything less than us. Defining who God is, something so much greater than we are, that there is that creator of creation right. kind of thing. So in order for him to be defined, in terms of we're talking about God, in terms of defining who God is, then we have to maintain that definition of a maximally great being, something sure. greater than ourselves, so that way... No matter how much knowledge he gives us, it can never be his knowledge. Sure. So. Yeah. Well, in, in in that case, I would say then I would I would remain with the arguments and say that he wouldn't create anything, because then only then would the state of affairs be absolutely pure godliness. In fact, it would be the most godly state of affairs that is even possible. Okay. Um, let's jump to um, your final argument. How do you assert then that we don't have um, or we don't know any? Sorry. We don't know any uh, proposition that has biblical justification, if I read your premises correctly. Uh, right, right, right. So what I was arguing there is a is in response to a particular uh, response to the problem of evil, um, in which one says that, look, we're not in a position to place probabilities on what God would or wouldn't allow, right? Uh, now, if that's, of course, if that's the case, then uh, it, all, it will also follow that we're not in a position to place probabilities on whether or not there exists a good that would justify God's lying. Now, that doesn't, now, the argument isn't saying that God has lied. It's only saying that the probability is completely beyond us. Um, because of the vast epistemic chasm that exists between God's knowledge and man's knowledge, um, given that, we're just simply not in a position to place probabilities on whether or not some particular biblical passages are lies. Now, of course, if that's the case, then we can't be justified in thinking that they're probably true. And, and, and so it means that we can't know them because we wouldn't have justification for them, or we wouldn't have warrant for them. So I, I guess I think the part that I take exception to then is the idea of adding in that you know the possibility that God is lying. Because if, sure. if we're if we are not sure, which I, which we could say that in many cases, especially when it, turns, when it comes to ideas of suffering, that there's no way we can look in the Bible and go, oh, this suffering is here. Okay, well then this is what I'm supposed to. This is how I'm supposed to react. Right. Um, certainly there's a lot of instances we can't do that. Well then, aren't we just as much, um, isn't it like a 50-50 chance that either what's God is either telling the truth or he's lying? So I guess the part that I'm taking issue with and I'm looking for further clarification is, is sure. why add in the lying piece of it when it's really a 50-50 shot? Well, I don't think that it's 50-50 though. I don't think that we're in a position to place probabilities, as I was saying. So to place probabilities, one would have to assume that our knowledge of the goods, evils, and entailment relationships that exist between them is roughly representative of those that actually exist, well, right? Only, only if that is the case can we really be confident in placing probabilities on these things. Uh, so I don't think that we're in a position to say 50 <laughs> I'll stop there because uh, I'm not going to have time for another question. So. <laughs> <laughs> uh, all right, now... Oops, sorry, one second. Okay, so now things are going to get reversed. Uh, it was asking me to update the stopwatch app. Anyway, so, um, this is your current enough. Yeah, yeah. Wait. All right, so, All right. All right. so you have eight minutes to cross exam. Okay. All right, um, I may have misheard this. Uh, tell me if I'm correct here. Did you at one point say in your response to the, um, to the God would not create anything argument, did you say that... Uh, that the God world would never really exist, that God would always create something because of his nature or something like that. Uh, that sounds close enough. I'm not okay. sure exactly where that was, but that basic idea that 
because you know, and what I'm looking at there is that you know we can we can talk about the existence of, of, of a God world, mm -hmm. um, but what I would rather talk about, what I think is more relevant to talk about, is the fact that we have something. So I would rather almost explain this existence now sure. rather than go into the possibility of some other some other universe or some other sure. situation in which God chose to create nothing except for leave Himself to hang out and do His thing. Sure, sure. Um, so, so if you're saying that creation was necessary, then, um, I mean, are you, are you saying that creation was not a free act? No, I'm not saying creation was necessary. I'm saying God, oh, okay. God just, you know, he desired to. Okay. You know, there's no, there's no, we, we, we are, God does not need us in any capacity whatsoever. Sure, sure. So. Um, okay, so, uh, in the response to the evidential problem of evil that I presented in my second argument, uh, you had responded by saying that there are many gratuitous evils, is that, is that right? The, the point that I was trying to make there is that um, we, can, we can maybe make the assumption that any one of us in this room might, ass might assert that a particular evil is gratuitous because in our own experience at that moment, sure, sure. we yeah. might feel that way. Yeah, so, so definitely, I, 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 obviously I would agree that a lot of these evils seem gratuitous, right? And, and when I say gratuitous, I'm talking about uh, uh, an instance of suffering or an evil is gratuitous if and only if God could have prevented it without missing out on some greater good or avoiding some greater evil. Mm -hmm. um, and so I guess what I'm saying then is that if, if you agree that gratuitous evil exists, you agree that God doesn't prevent evils really for any reason, like he... He does, as in God doesn't need a good reason uh, to prevent an evil. Um, he can just play hands off and not care about the justifying goods. Okay, yeah, let me, let me clarify see what you're saying. Uh -huh. um, so my, my first comment in terms of we can feel as though these evils are gratuitous because we may never know in some larger right. scheme of things what is actually <laughs> happening behind the scenes. So it may seem for years, you know, why did, you know, my aunt get cancer, or why, whatever. Mm -hmm. uh, but God's action within the world is obviously his free choice to do what he needs to do based on his will, based on what he desires to do. Evils which are allowed to exist. Right. Um, and, you know, the the common Christian, you know, theological answer would, you know, would be, well, you know, God allows evil, so it gives a chance for Christians to be compassionate and all those wonderful things, which, okay, fine, but the, the basic thing that I'm trying to show is that these evils must exist in order for us to have oh, okay. any kind of idea of what good is. Okay. If, we, if we assume the knowledge, if we, if we assume something's evil, we're assuming we have a standard to which to compare, which means we have good. If we have good, then we have a standard which we, which we compare to see that things are good. Therefore, we need some kind of giver of that good, and, you know, therefore... And sure, sure. Right so, okay, so then under that definition that I gave of gratuitous evil, uh, you would accept that there are no gratuitous evils because <laughs> the sufferings that we endure, God only permits them because of the greater good of our coming to know the, the moral standard. I don't think it's that simple, uh, either a or, black or white. You that's know, a plausible you know, answer, I mean, but there's a reason yeah. why God's letting these things happen. He's not, he's not just saying, eh, whatever. <laughs> like, he, he's, like he's allowing these terrible things to happen to these people, but it's okay even if they don't understand it because it's justified by some other thing that God knows about. We would justify their God's grand scheme of things, yes. Okay, okay, okay. All right. Um, oh, and you had, um, in response to my last argument, you had said that God uh, does not lie, that the, the, that is the Christian belief that, of course, that Scripture is, is, is absolutely true, um, that, that uh, God does not lie, that it's, in, it's part of the Christian belief that it, he has an inability to lie, actually. Um, presumably, you would refer to, like, Titus or something that says, you know, it's impossible for God to lie. Um, what I'm curious, though, is, is if, if God is the inspiration to the biblical text, and he is lying, and he put in the lie that he can't lie, you know what I mean, like, I'm, that's what I'm wondering, is that, like, you can't really use that to justify 
the Christian believes that God can't lie without begging the question. No, absolutely. No, 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 I totally agree. I'm not making you scripture to sure. justify scripture. That doesn't work. Okay. Um, if I, and anytime I'm justifying the use of scripture, it's it's the um, the manuscript evidence in the New sure. Testament that shows that it is what we could consider 6,000, roughly 6,000 manuscripts closer to date in to its original than any other document in antiquity of its kind. Right. Um, but yeah, you know, which just means there was a lot of copiers, right? A lot of copiers, and they're all 95 to 99 percent accurate right. to each other. Yeah. Right. Um, yeah, I would only, uh, well, let me, um, I guess, talk of the resurrection argument. Um, so, what do I want to say? Oh, okay, well, okay, so you had, you had talked about uh, free will being a, a great good uh, that could be a, a plausible reason for why God would create things, uh, and, and presumably why God would allow uh, moral suffering between uh, humans. Um, one question I would like to know is, do you think that there exists uh, free will in heaven? Yeah, heaven's a, I'll say this much, heaven's a tricky thing because we're, you know, if, if we were to look at scripture itself, um, we don't have a whole lot of information on what heaven's like. And I know there's a lot of Christians out there that like to speculate on what heaven's like, and there's a ton of books. You know, every person that, yeah, that has a near-death experience has a, has a book on what that was like. <laughs> and that's one of them, I think that's great. But, um, if we take it directly from Scripture, we don't really know how that operates. And okay. I'm not going to, I mean, I, I could sit here and speculate, and we could, you know, talk theologically until the cows come home, but really, you know, at the end of the day, sure. we're going to say, I don't know. Sure. Um, so, so, I don't know, I guess it's a, it's a plausible assumption that, that Christians believe that there are, is no sin in heaven. Would you say yes to that? We would say there's no, yes, yeah, no sin in heaven, and, and then theologically speaking, new heavens, new earth, when God recreates everything, then right, there's no, no sin there. No sin there. Correct. Um, so I guess the point I'm making is that um, if there is free will in heaven, then, of course, uh, God doesn't need to allow sin in order for people to be acting perfectly and to have free will, right? Because it's not as though the world is logically necessary to create heaven. Um, and, oh, I guess I'm, we're done. <laughs> yeah, you had four good seconds there. Uh, yeah. we, it was we solid. We continue that, that, that question. Yeah. Okay. okay, so uh, now we're moving on to the closing statements. Uh, you're each going to get five minutes for your closing. Uh, Stephen, you're up first. Oh, and also now is a really good time to get those question cards filled out uh, if you have anything. And right after the closing statements, we'll come through, we'll grab them, and then yeah, pass them to the middle person. <laughs> okay. All right. All right. Well, first, let me say once again that I do um, want to thank everybody for for coming out and, and listening to such an important discussion. Um, I certainly hope that you have weighed in on all the evidence. Um, I think good arguments were presented on both sides. Um, I think you know, a good discussion has, has happened and probably will continue um, as the days and weeks go by um, amongst all of you, and I think that's wonderful. Um, in closing, let me say this. There are a lot of reasons we could say that God does, in fact, exist. Um, can we prove beyond the shadow of a doubt? Well, no. Can I give a ton of evidence? Absolutely. At the end of the day, we can say that if Jesus resurrected from the dead, regardless of what we have in Scripture, and regardless of what we have um, philosophically or scientifically or all the the academics we can throw out there, if Jesus resurrected from the dead, then that's all we need. Because that means that everything that God had promised, everything that God had said, everything that God has promised doing, is absolutely true. I think I've laid out several good arguments uh, from existence, from morality, that because something exists, there must be a cause. 
that because objective morality exists, there must be a giver of that more morality, and we must have some sort of God that, um, um, that allows for that to happen. And that the evidence that Jesus resurrected, although I gave very, very small amounts of it, um, when you look deeper, is somewhat overwhelming uh, in terms of the explanations of the empty tomb and what actually happened. The simple fact of the matter is that people don't die for things that they know are a lie. And we have eyewitness testimony of that. So, if you're in that place tonight, if you're in that place where you don't know, I would invite you to explore the Christian God and Jesus much more thoroughly and explore the evidence. Dig into it. Challenge yourself. Don't um, listen to the just the surface stuff that people might put at you. Dig into all of the evidence. I would encourage you that it's worth your time um, and it's worth devoting, uh, devoting your time and life to that kind of pursuit and, and study. And if, and if you want to speak further, um, I am more than happy to talk afterward. Uh, and I would even invite any of you tonight, if you have not accepted Jesus, uh, to do so. Uh, maybe even tonight. Thank you again. Uh, I consider this a, a, a rare but um, honoring privilege uh, to have been able to participate. Uh, and any, any questions I welcome um, and any conversations afterward, um, come on by and, and we can talk. Thank you. dogmatically uh, on one side, uh, it's still worth your time to explore uh, the arguments. Um, if not for whether or not you want to find truth in that issue, uh, it's still important to uh, refine your thinking. Uh, you, you become a better thinker, you navigate the world. Um, to learn the skill of critical thinking, I think, is, is such an important, essential thing, um, and I think it's a tragedy that our schools don't actually focus on that, rather they're focused on memorization. Um, um, so that said, uh, I don't think there are any uh, theistic arguments that are successful, um, or any cumulative cases that are successful um, to establish a, a even plausible um, belief in the Christian God, a justified uh, belief would warrant. Um, and um, I guess, um, I'm just winging it here. Um, <laughs> but what I do want to say, I, I really want to thank all of you for coming out. This is, this is a very pleasant surprise. I, I was not at all expecting this, this number of people, and I think that I speak for the, the rest of the, the leadership here um, of the um, Ferris State Secular Student Alliance here, that uh, they're very happy you guys came. Um, these questions are are, like I said, they're, they're very interesting questions. And the nice thing about the God debate uh, is that studying these issues leads to so many more interesting things. Um, a good, a good um, doing moral philosophy, for example, is something that you're going to eventually be doing if you study the God debates. Uh, you're going to get into science. You're going to get in. It's connected to so many fundamental concern, human concerns uh, about our world, and and. And even just for that sake, I think it's worth uh, getting into. So I would highly recommend, um, even if theology bores the crap out of you and you have no upbringing that for some reason makes you obsessed with these interesting questions like me, um, it's still very much worth your time. Um, uh, and again, I, I just want to thank you all for coming out. And uh, it was an honor to uh, speak with you today.
question. We're not quite done yet. We have anyone that has their own questions. If you got a chance, that guy just gave a paper. That was a good question. Uh, he gave him all the paper. Uh, so that's not cool. Um, so anyone that has questions that want to be answered, anyone that wants to stick around for that portion of it, great. Um, if we have time at the end, um, we're going to try to have just general questions if you want. I'm sure they'll have plenty of time to talk after this is over. Uh, so we'll see how fast we can get um, some questions. Yeah. Now we're just biding our time until we get to those questions. Yeah. There's uh, books out there you can go by. So several people that have to stand and or sit in the middle. Uh, there's probably chairs available now. So you I use my own wiring diagrams right Jeez, now. Jeez, look at these. I mean, I just read it. I have to, like, read it. Okay, that's better. That's a possible idea. exists for someone who believes there is no God? And if no hope exists, why even continue to struggle for anything? Um, hey, so, hope. Uh, what does it mean? Well, at least to my mind, hope means um, a kind of... Um, well, shoot, I would to define hope by using hope. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, a kind of positive view of a plausibly good future, right? And... and um, and I think that that's perfectly rational. I don't see a problem with, um, you know, looking into the future and seeing um, how, first of all, like the, the development of the kind of moral zeitgeist in our, in our society where we come to uh, embrace and recognize the rights of, of people like the LGBT community. Um, I think that's an incredible uh, improvement. Um, and... I think that morality generally moves along that plane um, toward the more inclusive and, 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 and the improved uh, moral view. And so I think that that's perfectly rational to think that that might continue to keep going. Now, of course, there are, uh, with the increase in technology, you have uh, potential for uh, disasters to be even more disastrous. That's, of course, true. But but I don't see how that necessarily needs to undermine a, a rational hope for a future that I think um, does look uh, good. Um, 
And um, of course, it, this is largely irrelevant to the truth of whether or not uh, you know Christianity is true, right? So it might be the case that there is no such thing as a rational hope for a positive future. That may be true, but of course that has nothing to do with, you can't infer from the fact that I don't like that things aren't great to the fact that therefore Christianity is true because it tells me nicer things about the future. Um, so that's, I guess, what I would say to that. Okay. <laughs> Hold on, let me see which one. Okay, we'll do this one next. <laughs> Okay, this is for Stephen. Uh, it's, uh, how can you be certain uh, that the God that you believe exists is the Christian God as opposed to another, for instance, Allah or any other theology? Yeah. It's a good question. Um, it comes down to the idea of absolute truth. If Christianity is true, and forgive me for this sounding mildly arrogant, but there's another way to put it, and I don't mean, I don't mean to sound that way, but it's going to come off that way. Is that if, if Christianity is true, then every worldview that opposes that is not. If Scripture is correct, then everything that opposes Scripture would not be. I mean, that's just the nature of truth. There's, like, there's no two ways around it. So Jesus says, and if Scripture is right, and I would assert that it's reliable based on what I had said earlier, that, that Scriptures are in fact reliable, if that's the case, then Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one gets to the Father but by me. Therefore, I'll stick with Jesus on this. And because he predicted his own, resur his own death and resurrection, and he was raised from the dead, it pretty much seals the deal for me in terms of that being what we would call the only way. Again, I know that sounds a little bit like, you know... Um, uh, an, an exclusive viewpoint, but it really, like I said, it really does rest on the idea that we can't say if one religion says this is the only way, then either they're right or they're wrong. So either I'm right or I'm wrong, and that's you know, and I'm and the overwhelming evidence in my view suggests that Jesus is right in this case. I, I respond okay. um, I think Steve is actually absolutely right. If if Christianity is true, then it follows that all other views that oppose it are necessarily false. Um, it just follows from the simple law of non-contradiction. Um, there's nothing uh, arrogant, although I recognize that some people will see, um, you know, absolute truth claims as that. And I think it's very wrong-headed. Um, unless you're willing to believe that contradictions can be true, then it must follow that if Christianity is true, all things that oppose it are aren't necessarily false. So I'm, I'm, I'm in absolute agreement with that. Okay. Uh, this one, I assume, is for you, um, but I think you can both touch on it uh, briefly. Uh, when talking about gratuitous evil, are we automatically assuming that we, as humans, deserve not evil, but good? Okay. Um, no, for me? Okay. Um, not necessarily. So um, the idea is that um, if God existed, and he loved us, then he wouldn't allow us to undergo unnecessary evils, right? So he might make me suffer for some unknown good in the future um, to, to acquire that, right? That may be one of God's reasons why I might suffer, but uh, he would have a reason. He wouldn't just, uh, at least a loving God who cares and is capable of, of helping, wouldn't just allow suffering for no reason. Uh, that just seems to be a necessary truth. Uh, I recognize that uh, there are some Christian philosophers, though they are in the minority, that, that would say that gratuitous evil is consistent with God's nature. I find those arguments wholly unconvincing. Um, but, uh, yeah, I think it's not about whether or not God uh, is obligated to make our lives happy. It's that God by his very nature, being a loving being, would not make our lives unnecessarily crappy. What was the question? I'm just trying to get it right. I want to answer the question. Absolutely. Um, it was, uh, when talking about gratuitous evil, are we automatically assuming that we, as humans, deserve not evil but good? Well, I guess it depends on if we're talking about do we not deserve, you know, we're talking about gratuitous evil in both capacities. Um, and how we view evil. Um, 
you know, we can we can view evil simply as the the absence of that which is good. Um, so, could we say, from a Christian perspective, we say, well, evil might exist in anybody's lives, but it may seem more unnecessary in in non non believers' life than in a believer's life. If, if that makes sense. It really comes down, in my view, of how you view, how you're looking at evil, what is evil, and what you view is unnecessary, or what you view is God allowing something that is punishing you in some way, or it's just, there's a, and I know from the Christian perspective, there's a lot of ways in which people see this. I know there are Christians out there that say natural disasters are the result of God's judgment on somebody. I'm not going there. So, um, because I don't necessarily think that's the case, even though we can see that maybe in the Old Testament or other places, but um, so it really it becomes a, a much more, I think, a nuanced uh, issue in terms of where you're seeing people from and where it's coming from and what view you're coming from in terms of how you see it. Okay. All right. Um, first, I'd like to point out this one came up with a lovely drawing on the back. Very nice. Anyways. <laughs> well done. Um, this one's a pretty simple one, but I, this is one I've heard a lot, so I think it, just a brief something from uh, from Justin would, would be good to clear things up for some people. Uh, if Christians believe in heaven after death, what does an atheist believe? Oh, uh, well, we believe that dying is the process of um, <laughs> no longer living. <laughs> um, that uh, someone who believes, or someone who rather um, does not believe, that there exists, uh, that the conscious experience of our being continues on past our physical death, uh, which is something that I, I think is, is not at all uh, justified. Um, I think that I just stop being an experiencer of life. Uh, I, I exist in the sense that, in the same sense that I existed prior to being born. Um, I just didn't. Um, there's a limit, there's a temporal limit to the experience that I have on this earth, and for that reason, uh, that is largely the motivator why I, why I concern myself with, with issues that I find fascinating, and why I uh, surround myself with uh, friends and family that I love, and why I um, try to be good and to help uh, my, my fellow persons that are also, whether they know it or not, limited in the experiences that they're going to have. Um, so yeah. Okay. Is it, is it until nine? Yeah, I was gonna say okay. maybe one or two more questions. Okay, just make sure. All right. <laughs> this is for Stephen. Uh, since humans lie and human wrote, humans wrote things about God, assuming we're talking about uh, sure. writing the original biblical canon, um, can we assume that at least some parts of our understanding of the divine is based on lies that people wrote? I would say that from just a historical perspective, we might say that's a possibility, but what we have in Scripture is, new, from the whole of it, from Old Testament to New Testament, we have one storyline about one God, about one promise, consistent over several thousand years, 40 different authors, and it's all consistent. Um, and even the supposed contradictions that people might bring up here and there, there's generally a pretty simple answer for everything that, you know, and it just comes down to simply understanding what is going on in Scripture, breaking it down to more than just taking this little tiny verse and throwing it out of context and saying, well, this says this here, and then this says this over here. See, they contradict, it must not be true. But when you look at the whole of it, you realize, well, that's not the case at all. That it is a unified and consistent message. And then you add in the archaeological evidence to Scripture, uh, especially in the Old Testament, and then you add in the uh, manuscript evidence of the New Testament, the Dead Sea Scrolls of the Old Testament, you can go on and on and on, that have put it up. And even so, we'll make it more common, then I'll, I'll shut up so we can ask that question, is... <laughs> The Bible is typically held by, um, by critics to a much higher standard than most other doctors can see. Like always, somebody's always trying to disprove it, uh, and they haven't really yet. Uh, so it just keeps holding up, keeps holding up. So 
anything's possible, but, you know, and I don't come from an apologetic viewpoint of assuming that the Bible is the inspired word of God. I think we can get there. I think it is. I believe that it is. As a Christian, I can't prove it's the inspired word of God, but I can prove that it's reliable. Okay. Um, but I'd like to, sorry, go ahead. I don't know if you're done. Okay. Yeah, um, well, so, so there are several claims in there that I would, I would be very, very cautious of accepting. Um, not the least of which was the claim that uh, archaeological evidence supports the Old Testament. Um, if you do uh, reading on these issues, uh, you'll find out that that's just not at all the case. Um, for example, uh, we have, there's something called an argument um, from silence. Uh, an argument can be, a particular observation can be evidence, or a lack of observation can be evidence against a hypothesis, if given that hypothesis, you were to expect to see a particular observation. So, for example, uh, the exodus, the, um, the huge migration outside, out of Egypt into uh, the, uh, the Levant area of, of Canaan, and the subsequent slaughter of the Canaanites, uh, you would expect to see some evidence of this. You would expect to, in the, um, the, the sheer number of people that it's possible, I cannot remember, but it's it's in the several thousands or millions. Um, you would expect to see a significant economic change in the stability of Egypt. We don't see it. You would expect to see um, things left behind, wandering 40 years in the desert. You don't see it. These are things you would expect to see. This is arguments, strong, strong evidence against the historicity of the Exodus. Um, you would expect, oh, and, and also, Pretty much, I know no. I, I know of no archaeologist who doesn't hold the following: that in some sense, the uh, the uh, the Israelites in Canaan, uh, we we first learned of the Israelites' existence as a people in something called the Renephthis field, which is found in Egypt, which makes mention of the Israelites. Um, there are no uh, like like. Um, historians or archaeologists that don't hold to something of the following, where the Canaanites are the Israelites. The Canaanites, or the Israelites are, are Canaanites who lived in the hill countries. And then when a, a drastic change started to happen, the, the passing away of the old city-states, you had the nomadic peoples uh, coming to live in, in a newer uh, city formation. Um, and that's just generally how uh, historians are looking at this issue right now. That's what all the evidence suggests. The pottery changes very little from the Canaanites to the Israelites. Um, there's, a, there's a continuation of culture there. It's not a brand new culture inserting itself and slaughtering the old culture. It's the same. It's just a matter of different uh, living conditions. Um, and there are several other, I mean, I don't have the time, but there are several problems. Okay, we have to be very brief on this last one, but it's a really good question. So, okay, this is a kind of a two-part question, similar but different questions for both of you. Stephen, what causes you to doubt your faith in Christ the most? And Justin, what makes you the most think slash wish Christianity is true? It's so kind of a good thing to close on. But uh, as profound as that is, we got to hurry. Real fast in thirty seconds or less. Um, when life gets hard, it's that simple. When life gets hard, you know, we ask the simple question of, you know, hey God, where are you now? Um, experientially, um, he shows up. Simple as that. Um, so the, the reason why I would wish Christianity to be true, or why I think it, reasons why I think it could plausibly be uh, but employed. What before. makes you either wish it were true, or say, hey, maybe that's not totally... Okay. Um, well, um, I think that I mean, this is a really difficult question because I honestly have a really difficult time answering it. Um, when it comes to evidence, something being more plausible on theism, you would need to know what would follow from theism, and generally people aren't willing to let you speculate about the, about the motivations of theism. So it's really difficult to say that something is more plausible or less plausible on theism. That's a big problem. Um, but I guess I want to answer the question of why I might wish it to be true. Um, I find appealing the idea of living longer than, you know, 80, 
some odd years, right? I find that appealing. I don't find appealing the idea of living for eternity. That horrifies me. Um, because anything that you enjoy for pleasure would, by the time, <laughs> by the time eternity ends, no. Um, anything that you would enjoy would just become just eternally uh, valueless. Uh, there's a reason why we value things that are limited in supply, and if you have all the time in the world, how can it possibly be of any value to you? Um, I like the idea of living longer, but I want to be able to end it. <laughs> I guess is what I would say. So there's some there's some things in Christianity that I do find appealing. Okay, all right. so that's it. Um, there are books for sale for sale on uh, Stephen's table and then on the right side as you walk out. There are SSA things on the left. Stop. <laughs> Again, I want to thank everybody for coming tonight. Um, I'd like to thank Justin, Stephen, Jake, and Hugo for their um, cooperation on this event. I want to thank Rob for getting the Chief Discovery Project involved in this and helping us with funding. Good job. And um, um, I'm pleased with this turnout more than I ever thought I would be. This is impressive, and I'm really grateful that everybody showed up. Um, if you're interested in joining uh, Secular Student Alliance, Fair State University, our table is right out by the door, like they said. And have a great night, safe drive home, and thank you for coming. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.